How are, How you? are you? I'm good. Rock it out with a bird. I expect any second now, we're about to see everything explode. But we're live. live. Now. Are we live right now? Yeah. yeah. What? All right, look, let's turn Why this on now. Yeah, because I turned that up just for a second there. But now, just like that, it is go time. We're going to go ahead and uh, do our live Q&A hangout. Howdy, beautiful folks. My name is Brian Brushwood, host of Scam School. You guys have seen the only show dedicated to social engineering at the bar and on the street. I don't know. Can we get a little uh, uh, verification that we're actually live. I'm not seeing anyone in the chat. That's somebody weird. saying it sucks, which means a- <laughs> we're probably live. And that, of course, would be uh, Justin Robert Young, the editor in chief of uh, iTricks. That's right. How long have you been doing iTricks now, Justin Robert Young? Good God. Um, you know, I think it was Thanksgiving 2007. Holy crap. Wait a minute. Probably. So that means, do you realize that that means you became editor in chief of the number one magic blog at the well, that's, exact that's same time? Well, that's also the same day that I became editor in chief of the number one magic blog was the day that there was a number one magic blog. That's so fine. Like, but, but, but the point I, I, is, I, I didn't ascend the ranks for anybody who's not familiar <laughs> with the site. But 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 my point is, do you realize that November of 2007 was the month that I pitched uh, to Revision 3 the idea of Scam School. I had just finished up my run at uh, Halloween Horror Nights, and it was while I was there in Florida doing the live show that I had the idea for Scam School. And originally, I was going to shoot Scam School just by myself. In fact, I bought two HD cameras. Well, you were already doing the the on-the-road stuff, right? Well, yeah, but that was just me. You know, that was just me making little YouTube vignettes of life on the road. uh, Sure. But that was your proto. That was proto... Scam school, correct? No, because I never, I only taught like a couple of tricks. That, to be honest, that was. Well, I mean, not, not in content, in like, hey, producing something for the internet could be A, fun to do, and right. B, something that would be good for my career. And in you that know, regard, like, yes, that is, that is absolutely correct. And in fact, uh, originally, uh, BBOTR, Brian Brushwood on the road, you know what? I should actually show people. Uh, for those of you guys who haven't seen it, um, I guess I'll show you a quick episode of BBOTR. But, but before, uh, the whole way Scam School came to be was I originally had sold an idea for development with Court TV at the time, a show about scams and cons. And as we went through it, I said yes to every dumb decision that I watched them make. Like I had an idea like, this seems like all really bad ideas. But I said yes to everything, and they got a very, very bland product. And, yeah. uh, and as a result, they passed on it. And I was so enraged at the way television works, this whole, like, you're going to do this, you're going to do this. And I realized, like, damn it, I just want to host a good show. And I was like, I want to know how to host a show. And so I realized, like, well, what do I got? I got um, an awesome tour schedule. I got a bunch of, uh, you know, full time on the road. I got a, a couple of cameras, cu- crappy cameras. So to kind of get my sea legs underneath me, I created uh, little vignettes of life on the road called Brian Brushwood on the road. And, uh, man, look at Look at how young that guy is. What? Uh, the um, you know you haven't changed, right? Like I mean, like that <laughs> might mean something to you. You're like, oh my god, because like I've you've looked at your own face enough. Nobody else can tell the difference. That's fine by me. Uh, but what we did like, there's was literally you've shown me videos of you like very early on, and it's like aside from like some very like very slight kind of facial changes the only difference is that for some reason in your youth you thought wearing pants close to your belly button was a really a hot fashion choice i can't even uh, i can't even like blame that on being the 90s or anything it was just comfortable that's all i that's all it was I just listen, that was just how you did you that, right. that was that was that was the thing isn't it so, by the way it's funny you were mentioning court tv real quick side thing sure sure isn't sure. it funny how like court tv is like ah oh, there's not enough court stuff so we're gonna do other reality things, and then Court TV became True TV, and now Headline News is like, ah, there's not enough news. Let's just cover court cases all the time. It's so funny, man. It's that grass is always greener thing, for sure. So uh, uh, so just take, uh, here's just a quick vignette. Basically, my, the idea with Brian Brushwood on the road was I needed to learn how to talk in front of a camera. I needed to learn how to tell stories and edit. And most importantly, when I did have an idea to pitch, I needed something that looked like I knew what I was doing. And uh, that's uh, uh, let's take a look at this one right here. I'll go ahead and pop this out. And 
Here we go. Let's take a look at this. Right. Tour all over the United States performing America's number one college magic show. I do stuff like fire eating, escapes, mind reading. These are the stories of what happens on the road. Somebody else could do something that I can. That's a dare, my friend. Thank <laughs> you. Well, no, 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 no. He said Simon could disappear from any bathroom anywhere. And I said, you know what? Give me two minutes. I'll be right back. I'll fall on my head. But yeah, we're, we're sitting there on the couch and we're like, he's like, Brian's in the ceiling. <laughs> 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 I don't know what happened next. The camera's on the floor, Seth's head hurt, and Brian's on the floor. <laughs> I would say that's not good. <laughs> oh, oh. That's how he did it, too. <laughs> <laughs> Holy <laughs> shit. Wow. That was kind of exciting. <laughs> All right, well, so, <laughs> tonight, Wipers an extreme uh, hotel makeover. <laughs> Hold that one up. Lesson, everything can be cleaned up. Uh, actually, no, that's not the lesson. The result, everything can be cleaned up. The lesson, don't ever do that again. There we go. So those were the uh, the on the road episodes, and they were all like these authentic raw times on the road. And so we were just me goofing around in an airport. But uh, and in in that whole year, I made like twenty of those vignettes, and they were invaluable. Uh, and and it, uh, especially when I finally went to the point where I called up Revision 3 and I had the whole pitch laid out. Uh, and this is a good question because a lot of people ask me where I get the, or how did I pit, how did I get Scam School on Revision 3? And part of it was I had a well-developed idea, like a four-page document with sample episodes. I was able to link them to episodes of On the Road that, uh, you know, that showed me hosting in a competent way. And then they approved the pilot. We shot the pilot uh, five and a half years ago. It was December 2007. And then the show got picked up the, two months later. We shot again in February and then launched in April, which was the first in April when we launched. was the first time you and I had ever spoken on the phone ever, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, a friend of mine uh, who was my roommate, uh, was, uh, by the name of Chris, he was a huge Revision 3 fan, was a Dignation fan, and uh, like... There was, uh, you know, it was on the site that Revision 3 had this new magic show, and he knew that I did a magic uh, blog, and he was like, you should talk to this guy. <laughs> and so I did, and little, little, did, uh, little did we know that we would later be gay married. Do, do you remember, do you remember, like, what's funny is I thought that Andrew Maine was the one who had told you to call, because I had met with Andrew Maine before, uh, the editor, or the create, the founder of, of iTrix. Yeah, the publisher. Um, no, I mean, I... I I did not I we had run on the site I believe a promo video that you did with like the Brian Brushwood action figure. Yeah, the Brian uh, Brushwood action figure was And I was... remember um that Andrew had, uh, had had we had had a conversation about how you were a good uh you were do, you were doing great college wise and specifically that you were better than other people in the college scene. <laughs> so take who that remain other nameless. People. <laughs> All right. Uh, well, hey, man, let's, uh, let's take some questions from the chat. We got the chat going right now. You guys go yeah. ahead and throw up some. By the way, uh, do you need it now that you're on test tube? Like, is it like when the WWF became the WWE and now forever? Like, it's like when I first pitched it to test tube. Like, uh, is it like, like uh, history yeah, you're is like, like Yeah, I've, I've, it's always been 
uh, test yeah. tube. It is, we've always been at war with East Asia. Exactly. Uh, it's like Revision 3 has always been the home of YouTube personalities. Uh, well, and actually, there's a lot of people who still ask. They're like, what is this test tube crap? And for those of you guys who don't know, if you're coming in late, uh, test tube is a new network created with, uh, you know, with Revision 3 and Discovery. Of course, Discovery owns Revision 3, but they wanted to work on it together. And I believe, I think... I might be the only show that got moved from Revision 3 over to Test Tube. I'm not entirely sure about that. They'll correct me. I'll tell you what. Correct me in the chat, J Jackie, if that's not the case. But I think that's it. Uh, okay. A few. Oh, here we go. Good question. Can we make a tutorial on other methods of lock picking? Uh, some people may remember that we did uh, that the, our most popular episode right now is uh, how to bump a key in seconds or like open a lock this in seconds. Of all time, key. no matter what, full stop. Yeah, 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 like, like, like 1, 1. 1.5 million views or something like that. Uh, nice. And uh, that's how it's labeled on YouTube. When it was originally released on the Revision 3 site, it was called How to Pick Locks Part 1. And there was ah. a Part 2, but somewhere it, it, in the first one we covered the bump key. In the second one, we learned uh, a little bit about using lock picks, learned how to drill a lock. Like, it was a long, like, three-hour shoot. We got all that stuff. But apparently, one, the most important of the three cameras the footage just completely got lost and it uh it, it, it and it, they just couldn't do it so it was sort of like you know it's never been on the you know we already took all that time to go meet with the locksmith and be on location and stuff so we so, weren't so able what to... what parts so everything but the bump key stuff got lost yeah lock picks drilling out a lock um uh the the lock gun the the trigger thing and all that so the answer is, is i really do and this do isn't that. a clever cover because you were legally informed that you should not put that stuff on the internet no no as a matter of fact the way i learned how to bump keys was by going on youtube and watching other local news reports where they gave all the details explaining exactly how it works and they said we're just telling you so that you get yourself a bump proof lock you know that kind of thing. like and yeah. it's true like the bad guys already know and there's no crime in bumping your own lock. And to be honest, it's freaking awesome. And it was a total blast to, to do that to my own lock. There ain't nothing wrong with a little bump, lock, and grind. <laughs> a little bump, bump, lock, and grind? Yeah. Uh, oh, people are saying, Grandpa Soldier wants to know, where can I buy that unicorn T-shirt uh, I was wearing? I get a lot of questions about the T-shirts that I'm wearing. And some of them, a lot of them come from a place called fullbleed.org from an artist named Rob Dobby. If you see anything that, that involves like industrial and environmental themes fused together, that's where that came from. Uh, anything that says Austin on it, I got at Parts and Labor in South Austin. Uh, and like, th you know, this, this, this T-shirt I'm wearing now came from Busted Tees. Uh, a lot of sponsors give it to us. I really want to. I really want to make a lot of that stuff available over at Scam Stuff because that the whole idea with Scam Stuff is I got tired of telling people where to go where for to other buy crap. things that you constantly get asked where yeah, to buy. Exactly. So it's just like, look, if I'm gonna do a thing on Scam School, we'll just have it all in one place. So it'll be a hell of a lot easier. Uh, somebody, in fact, asked us about. Um, you know, we had mentioned that we had $8 bump keys, or I, I found bump keys for $8 some, online sometime. Uh, those days are long gone. So I still get that question where people are like, well, BS, I can't find bump keys for $8. Um, yeah, so sorry about that. Uh, but they but you can get some sweet stuff. bump keys off scam stuff. That's, right? that's true. We got custom ones. Just saying, y'all. Uh, what do you guys think? Ain't nothing wrong. That's what you're going to be saying when you're bumping what? the hell out of that lock. What do you guys think? Bumping uglies is what I call it. That's the funniest Locks scam. scam. <laughs> what, do, what do you think is the funniest scam? I know my pick for this. Uh, I don't even know if you have one. Do you have one? Uh, the funniest episode or just yeah. the funniest scam e in general? Either idea. Just, just Besides go. the encroaching federal government. <laughs> what? You, just, you get on a political soapbox? <laughs> Uh, I don't know. Like the funniest scam, like of all the scams in the world. Like, I mean, I don't well, I'll know. tell you mine. Like, for, I mean, this. Tell scam, me. You know, you, I guess I'm I'm confused by the question. The but funniest episode of Scam direction. School. The funniest thing we taught. The best best thing. And that one is for sure the 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 quarter on forehead one. Like that one uh, where you. And that was was that quarter? the first episode? It was like the second or third, I think. I think uh, I think it might have been the third. Yeah, it was part of that that pilot shoot. I mean, that's why. Like, I front loaded it when when we. When once they said yes to doing a pilot of scam school, I had this feeling of like, oh man, so what do I start with? And um, I was like, well, out of all the stuff I know, there's really only 15 that I think are really freaking good. You know, should I save some of those for down the road? 
And uh, and this is this is actually a life philosophy thing. If you've uh, if you've never seen the movie Gattaca from the early '90s, there's a there's a moment where there's two brothers who have a rivalry, and despite having none of the genetic advantages, the younger brother yeah, one, keeps doing one better. is born human, and the other is in this dystopian future. You have designer babies that are free from uh, cancer and and genetic defects, and you know the fact that your parents had heart attacks, so now you would like that's all gone except for this natural kid and his genetically perfect brother. Correct. So by all logic, he shouldn't be as good as his brother. And they do this swimming contest and the younger kid, you know, the, the natural born, or I guess the older one, the, the weaker kid keeps winning. And uh, as adults, there's this moment when, uh, when they're, they're out trying it again as adults. And he turns to his brother and says, you want to know how I beat you all those times? Uh, because the game was you'd swim out as far as you can. And then, you know, whoever chickens out first wins yeah. uh, or, or loses. And he says, you want to know how I beat you all those times? He says, I never saved anything for the swim back. And that was the exact thought that went into my mind. Uh, the model, what made me believe that it would be a good idea was the fact that you know, Mythbusters had been running for years already, and they had already run out of all the traditional urban legends. I mean, you remember Mythbusters used to be about urban myths, and then it just became about whatever the hell idea the chat, you know, their, their forums proposed lately. And I just yeah. remember thinking, like, I'm going to lead off with all of my best everything, and if we get to episode 40 and I don't know what to do next, that will be a very, very good problem to have. Yeah. And uh, and so so that's why that's why those first, you know, uh, some of the most popular content is still those first uh, 15 episodes or so. And, and by the way, you know, that the writer of Gattaca took that uh, advice to heart, that it was an axiom for him to live by because he wrote that movie. And then he wrote in time with Justin Timberlake. <laughs> so he obviously <laughs> saved nothing for after Gattaca. <laughs> that's a good point. Uh, all right, Paul Ford wants to know what we're watching on Netflix right now. Uh, Orange is the New Black. I just finished it. Did you see it, Justin? Uh, I am on episode four or five still, one of those two, uh, but it's really, really good. And by the way, uh, Netflix, Emmy nods. They yeah, went from dude. not a show, not a network to, to like a real thing. four or five Emmy nominations, like – that's uh, that's pretty sick, man. It's huge, that's, man. That's huge. I, for one, make sure to go to Netflix.com slash Scam School, sign up for their free 30-day trial, watch all the Netflix I want, and then say Baxies, and then that way score us free beers while getting, keeping them swimming in free drinks. I, I like to go to Netflix.com slash Other Network. No! <laughs> all right, what other questions do we got here? O-T-H-E-R, N-E-T-W-R-K. No! <laughs> Let's see. Go, let's uh, get a few other questions here. What's the one close-up trick I'd like to be able to do that I haven't already learned? Oh, it's a good one. You know, it's here's the thing for me, and and I I suspect this is part of why. For, okay, when when I was doing magic as a hobby, and I think a lot of people are like this. You watch other people's acts like you're shopping, and and at the lowest end of the spectrum, you have people who don't even realize that some of this is original content that belongs to someone else and it's not yours to just, you know, steal and do on your own. Like that just doesn't even occur to him. Uh, but then, uh, but then, you know, but then there's a lot of magicians who do very stock material and you can see yeah. something you like and you find out it's on the market and you buy it and you do it. Which is why, by the way, magicians are terrible audiences. Oh my God. Because they have all the enthusiasm of walking through uh, the HEB and perusing the cereal. Like, you know, when you're, when you're looking at cereal, you're not like, yeah, Cocoa Pops, I've never seen that before. Like, and so magicians, when magicians perform for them, and this is like at conventions or at the Magic Castle, you will know at the Magic Castle that the, mag the magicians that are in the audience, because somebody will kill on stage and everybody will clap except for the three. Oh, mm. the, magi the traditional magician watching a magic show pose. Yeah, man, if there's one thing, let me take this moment. Anyone who's ever doing magic tricks, if you consider yourself a magician, do me one favor. When somebody does a trick for you, be a decent audience. You know <laughs> how an audience should react. When somebody, at, when you can tell because you're a magician, you can tell like they're getting ready to do the freaking move. When they ask you a question and look into your eyes, you look into their goddamn eyes. You look yeah. right at them because you know that's what they want them to do so they could do the move right underneath you. That's just, please, that's all I'm asking you. Be I'm just, because as, as uh, 
legendary uh, magic figure Jean Robert Houdin said that the magician is really an actor playing the part of a magician. What is oft forgotten is the second part of that quote is the magician uh, when an audience member needs to play the part of a human being that has feelings <laughs> and emotions and not a cold robot who is surveying the mechanics of what's happening below him. You're damn right about that, man. Uh, I forget what the question was. Oh, uh, oh so, so here's what happens is once I decided – once I had the thought that maybe I'd like to go professional, all of a sudden it was like um, once, I, once I quit my day job, I shut down all of the way I interact with the magic, magic uh, clubs and stuff. I, I canceled all of my magic magazine subscriptions. I stopped going to shows because all of a sudden I realized it's lose-lose. Every time I went to another performer's magic show or even watched another performer perform, one of two things would happen. Either I would hate what they were doing, in which case I've wasted my time and it just makes me mad at magic, uh, or I would love what they're doing, which is just as bad because, I, it, it, because they've done it, and now they've done it and I can't do it. And now if I do something similar, it'll be because I'm ripping them off. So as a, as a direct result, it's like you know I dove into books and tried to create my own stuff. That way, even if by coincidence, I was recreating something someone else had done, at least, you know, at least I could honestly say is like, well, you know, it was an accident. I didn't know, or, you know, that, that kind of thing. I wanted whatever I created. Well, cause so much, so much pure. of the original stamp in magic is presentation, right? Yeah. You yeah. Know, and, and you can't unsee someone else's take on it. And that's really when you see, uh, and, and now lately the new, the, the freak out du jour in magic is, uh, people overseas, like in Russia and China and, and stuff like that, where now with YouTube, you have basically what a young performer there would look at as a tutorial to copy literally every little element of it. And what makes it just the dead set ripoff is how they do it, is, is the elements of like, and then they tip to the audience. Now, this is nothing new. It's happened forever. stateside forever. And I'm sure in, in other you know, like Western Europe and everything, anywhere where there is magic conventions. But now, all of a sudden, because of YouTube, you can have Chinese acrobats completely ripping off the blast-off, uh, you know, for love routine from Penn & Teller. Or, right. uh, you know, there was a Russian, or I think it was the Ukrainian the, you're talent. Talking, well, it, it, well, and there was, that's the other thing. It's a two-sided coin now where it's like uh, because of, of the proliferation of a clip will go viral on YouTube and explode all over the country or all over the, over the world, whereas previously somebody might have 20 years ago come to the United States or come to England or whatever and seen someone like, uh, like Piff. Uh, what's his point? Yeah. Is, is it Piff the Magic Dragon? Is that what it is? Piff the Magic B Dragon, yeah. Right. Uh, right. Uh, who, who, if you've not seen that, that just, just search it on YouTube. He does, he's on originally Penn & Teller's Fool Us and just kills it, utterly slays it with one of the funniest, most unique presentations I've ever and seen. And loses the competition, which was ultimately, I believe, a core failing of that show, is that somebody came out and did the most original funny routine that was on the entire series, and because it didn't, like, fool Penn & Teller, he was a loser, as opposed to that was very obviously, you know, the biggest winner and most enjoyable element. They should have added, like, an audience favorite aspect to it, to where ostensibly it's about fooling Penn & Teller, but really, you know, you don't care if you fool Penn & Teller. What you really but want to do but is But that's win the thing the with magic, the right? Is people want, they're like, oh, well, let's find out if, if they fool him. Like, like, that's something that we think we want. No, but, but we like, don't. We know. Not right. really. We want, we want Piff. We want yes. a guy who's hilarious and funny and we laugh. And, like, for the vast majority of the audience, they're like, I don't know how that card became the card that it was supposed to be, you know? Well, and the, but here's the important part is because of YouTube, that clip yeah. you know, went throughout all over the world so that when somebody in the Ukraine on some version of, like, Ukraine's Got Talent or whatever came out and knocked off note for note down to the, the timing of the banner roll to the bits to the sound effects. Like, he randomly eats a banana – during the act and that's like part of it because he's like the act is that piff is this kind of like uh disaffected kind of bratty sort of right. character and at some point while he's waiting for penn and teller to uh, talk about his act he just takes out a banana and starts eating it like whatever dude like yeah. you guys can talk i'm here to eat the banana and uh the ukrainian guy also ate a banana on stage it was just it was note for note it was ridiculous but, but the best part was when it got to the last judge you know he's sitting there doing all of piff's stick and then the last judge would be like uh if i'm not mistaken 
uh, this entire act is ripped off note for note from a previous performer. Is that the case? And just the, like, you know, his face sags down and he just gets totally owned. And it's like, because, like, there's an accountability. It's a two-way street. Some people say that YouTube is causing this rash of ripping off, but on the, but there's a flip side as well. There's a rash of accountability uh, because now you can't get away with doing a few local college shows stealing someone's act because they've all got cell phones out. And then they're like, hey, man, I think someone was doing your act forwards the clip to you and it's like you know the, the hammer comes down on it yeah I, I think it's just it's it's a new avenue and and to assume that the internet somehow invented thieving amongst magicians is really a laughable one and and to think that i mean the internet is no matter what you think of of piracy and stuff like that like it is a issue but it's not like people at, it's not a new issue it's not like people at magic clubs haven't been buying one dvd and copying them off for everybody else in the magic club uh for a long 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 time now or dubbing tapes as long as dubbing tapes was a thing so yeah no kidding it's uh, it's you know it's whatever all right we got a few other questions here where are my spikes you want to field that one for me justin uh brian's an adult and he's not <laughs> a marionette he can do what the hell he wants with his hair uh i mean well let me let me ask you about the spikes because the spikes went through various forms. Like, you used to have dyed hair, right? And the spikes used yep. to be larger than they were yep. uh, toward the end. What was your evolution? Was it just like, hey, this is a way that I can stick out. I can define myself visually. Let me maybe pull my pants down a few inches so they're not uh, <laughs> hugging my belly button as if it's uh, a way for them to live. Uh, okay, so it started off like uh, when I graduated college, I wanted a distinctive look. And so for two years, I had bright neon green hair. In fact, actually, if you know, if you're familiar with Twit Networks, Chad Johnson, he's what, what he's what, what, what other he's doing networks, other his, networks, yeah, other networks, Chad Johnson, he uh, he wears his hair, uh, you know, bright red, uh, because he wants to be stick have a sticky look. And it's worked out well for him. That's what I was doing with uh, with green hair. But it was a, it was a different time. and It was too much like I'd have a gig. At a, you know, you take whatever work you can get. And so some church would like hire me for their youth group. And then I'd show up and they'd be all like, uh, yeah, I think there's been a mis misunderstanding. Uh, we hired the magician. And I'm like, that's me. Crazy green haired, pumped out guy. And, yeah. um, you know, and so then I started, I started originally just kind of wearing it vaguely up, but then that started to become fashionable. And so, uh, in fact, so you I would wear it up like almost in four, if this is a semi magic audience, like almost like, like a Rudy Kobe kind of thing. Like it was like, yeah, more like a, a closer to like, to a, like a Murray thing, uh, Murray Sawchuk oh, thing. Oh, like a Murray Sawchuk. Okay. To, to be honest, uh, when I realized it was becoming fashionable was when, uh, I was on tour with Rascal Flats and Brad Paisley and Brooks and Dunn. And, uh, and I guess at the time, I looked uh, startlingly, startlingly close to uh, the lead singer of Rascal Flats. And enough to where, as I walked around, people would be like, Rascal Flats, I love you. I'm like, I'm not him. They're like, no, I know you guys say that. Will you sign this? And so that was when I was just like, okay, this can't go. So that's yeah. when I started using beeswax to like, like Liberty Spike it. And in yeah. fact, there's, a, the, there's photos of, oh man, I got to see if I can find this photo. But um, your your hair was like uh, it it had its own life cycle. Like you were like uh, uh, photos of you. You can date it like a tree, you know, by by the 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 how high your spikes went and they have slowly right. receded. Well, they went they went super high. And that and that because the more punked out they got, the happier I was because the less like a normie I looked. And walking around in real life, people remembered. Man, they all definitely uh, didn't have any problems remembering it. And then, um, holy crap, there it is. This is, uh, let me see if I can find the exact one. But then, once I started shooting Scam School, all of a sudden I realized that what looks uh, adorable and kind of punk rock and, and silly in normal life is uh, all of a sudden just reads as a desperate cry for attention from, uh, from, you know, from a douchebag uh, on, on video. And so that's when you'll notice them getting shorter and shorter and shorter until finally, at some point, uh, to be honest, this, this top secret project that I'm working right on, uh, is as good excuse as any be like, well, screw it. I'm just going to wear normal hair for a little bit. So you are, you, the hairstyle that you have now would be what people, uh, should the fruits of this super secret project, uh, cross the field of vision of anybody watching, that's what they're going to see. Uh, yeah, probably. Uh, for, I mean, like, listen, but the spikes were about you. If the spikes are no longer for you, then you don't have a responsibility to wear them. Yeah. You hear that people? Yeah. Uh, dude, I can't find, I can, I can find pictures of that tour, but I can't find the one of me and, uh, Gary LaVox from, 
uh, Rascal Flats, whatever. But I'll show like, it some but other time. Here's, I guess here's the thing with, with you know, the, the spikes, because I think what changed is that the spikes were from an era, not to say pre-internet, but pre-social internet, pre-ubiquitous uh, internet, where like, if you would you see saw... somebody once and they could totally fade from your memory and, and it was like whatever you could do to desperately be remembered. But it, was yeah, but if it was hook. like, oh, we had a magician last year and then the person who's booking colleges is walking around the floor at NACA and they're like, oh, we liked him. Which was the magician? Was he uh, one of the white? Was he the white guy? No, <laughs> yeah. maybe he was the white guy. <laughs> yeah. Was he the, oh, I could have sworn. Was he that white guy? No. Oh, the white guy with the gigantic spiky hair. Exactly. There we go. But then, you know, when you have a relationship with people weekly online and you're talking to them, it, it there becomes – now it becomes why are you keeping up this artifice as opposed to, hey, that's a thing I remember you by. Right. Uh, we got another question here. Left Garrow wants to know if I prefer uh, the plastic cards, uh, like the – what do they call them? Bicycle prestiges or whatever or paper cards. Uh, there are a few moves that become extra, extra cool with a plastic deck. And when those first came out, I met, you know, I grabbed one and was using them, but there's a lot more stuff that you suddenly can't do. And when you get used to, um, uh, you know, a lot of the, the touch moves that I learned, I learned on paper cards. So I continue to use paper cards. Everything I do is like, you know, us playing card company, uh, uh, air cushion finish. I, I will give this p piece of advice. A lot of people are like, well, you know, it takes a while for me to break in a deck just right. And the moment I hear that, like, I remember going through that exact same phase. Like, I had one deck that was broken in just right. I could do all the moves that I wanted. Uh, the problem with thinking that way is that you are now, like, that is a special deck. And if you don't have it, or let's say you want to use a tricky deck of cards that uh, doesn't happen to have the exact same uh, d uh, design so you can't mix it with your cards, uh, that's the problem. Whereas if you... If you, if you train yourself with, uh, with brand new decks of cards, and now the problem is that it's expensive, right? So it's like you got you to gotta keep buying brand new decks of cards. But if you get to the point where you can, you know, just bust open a brand new uh, pack and immediately start doing your pressure fans, or your pop moves or your double lifts or whatever, then, um, you know, then you're going to be in a much better place because you will always be able to get a brand new deck of cards. And you don't yeah. have to worry about them warping or somebody messing them up. Well, let me ask you this because magic is so much about the props and about the setup and so much of a, a, a magician's persona kind of comes stems from that OCD uh, necessarily you know to to maintain the act uh, would you say that it is a worthwhile thing to train yourself not just with cards but to train for a young magician to train themselves to live in those moments of panic when there will be gaps in that preparation by way of a force of nature or like... Well, you that, definitely... Uh, you, you want to... Um, a, a friend of mine once said that uh, practice doesn't make perfect. Practice makes permanent. So, so what you do most of the time becomes what you're capable of doing. And this is the reason that, uh, you know, Penn and Teller say that the most important thing is flight time. The, the way they put it is like when a pilot goes to Delta and says, hey, bro, I'd like to fly your planes. They don't say, have you ever had an engine go out? They don't ask, have you ever had someone have a f heart attack in the middle of a flight? They, say, they don't say, have you ever had, you know, a, a lightning storm that blinded you or your instruments go down? They ask one question. They say, how many flight hours have you accrued? And because they, they know that if you have 10,000 hours of flight time, you faced everything that you're going to face. And so likewise, uh, you know, don't do what's easy. They talk about, uh, if you read, uh, there's a book called Little Bets that talks about how taking risks uh, yields incredible amounts of learning, far more learning than any amount of, of, uh, of, of book learning or even practice will do because you step outside your comfort zone every time you make a little bet. And for me, you know, even something doing like this, we didn't really have much of a plan with the q and I didn't know how many people would turn up. Could have been a disaster. You know, I originally five years ago. I was ago, initially not wearing a shirt. And you were just, yes. Uh, you had your wear face painted. Bring yeah. back the spikes across your chest. And I was exactly. like, I don't think that's a good call. No, I had just blood smeared on my face. But the thing is, is, is the stakes, though, are small because if I fail, what's the worst thing that can happen? I could look like an idiot in a clip that lives on the internet forever. So what, man? Uh, look, I have been on stage with 900 people in the audience who abjectly hated my act and no lie through effing fruit at the stage. Like that's a real thing, that cliche that you see from the cartoons. They threw fruit at my stage. Thankfully, they waited till after I left. Uh, I felt yeah. pretty crappy after that show, but 
it allowed me to deconstruct, to break down, like, what, what was it that didn't click with them? Okay, well, we're in the yeah. mountains of uh, West Virginia, and they Don't clearly, like... Don't play farmer's markets anymore. Exactly. Well, it's like, in the, and I was like, the one thing they liked was the part when I was making fun of traditional magicians because they thought I was being a traditional magician. And so it occurred to me, I was like, well, you know, what are some things I could do if I ever face myself in that same situation again? So I was like, well, I can learn some alternate presentations for stuff to cover this. I could do some, you know, have some video content that'll help get them in the right frame of mind because they clearly weren't expecting me. And so as a result, like now when you come into the stage show, there's a 30 minute pre-show that, that is all, it's all entertaining stuff, but it's really about selling you on who Brian is and what the non-traditional flavor of the Bizarre Magic show is going to be. So that even, so at least when we get to my stuff, it won't be a surprise for them. Does that make sense? Yeah, uh, and and your show is polished, uh, to to say the least, in that regard. You know, it is it is absolutely something that has been all all, all the rough edges have smoothed, and and uh, it it shows. You know, it's a great, very very personable, uh, big personality kind of magic show. Yeah. Uh, all right. So we got some other questions. Film riot or scam school? Justin, pick one. Film riot. Yeah, no, that's, I agree. Film right for the win. Dude, I uh, swear, I will, I, I, you know, they live three and a half hours north of me now. And it's like, I'll drive yeah. up there just on the off chance that, like, like just to hang out and be all like, you guys aren't shooting anything, are you? Because I was like, I'm just, I'm just around. Maybe, yeah, and then, uh, yeah, maybe a sketch with uh, laser eyes. I don't know. That'd be fun. Uh, yeah, no, I mean, in all, in all seriousness, those are two shows that to me just define hard work and presentation and people who are at better at their good. craft in the most recent episode than they were at the first episode, which is not, again, not a new story, but an awesome story uh, to see when, when the personalities are so relatable in an internet setting. Absolutely. So uh, what about this? Someone's asking, like, what do you do when a trick fails? And part of it is... Uh, and uh, to me, the way I learned all of this stuff was just by trial and error. Uh, I got I told, all right here. So let me let me throw it out, and then you tell me whether or not I'm giving good advice. Okay, go. Trick fails. Yeah. You uh, immediately like you know those uh, those wooden uh, puppets that when you press the bottom of it, they, they just they, crumple. They just go, yeah. Yeah. They, like like that. Yeah. Sure. I, you do that <laughs> like as a human, and then you just start crying. <laughs> That's, that that used to be my favorite tactic. That used to be what okay. I did every time. And then uh, eventually, if you cry long enough, they're like, "Oh, I'm <laughs> sorry." Uh, yeah, man. So uh, this was, uh, I told Justin this story, and uh, look, here here's my advice for you. What what do you do when a trick fails? Is uh, inwardly as painful as it is. I want you to think good, and in your mental ledger just put another tick mark on failure because here's the thing there is no success without failure they say if you yeah. want to double your success rate you need to double your failure rate you don't learn anything from from doing well you learn from your mistakes and every single person you respect when they say if you ask them hey man have you ever had like an epic fail live on stage or or have something go terribly wrong i guarantee you that the more you respect them and the more successful they are the better their stories will be of how horrifically bad everything went. You know, like Teller talks about, uh, in that first letter he sent me, he talks about how Penn and Teller were performing in the middle of Philadelphia during a full-on race riot all around them, but they kept doing the show because they needed the money. Like, that's how bad they yeah. needed the gig. Uh, and so, um, yeah, so, so here's what you do. Which isn't so much of a failure as it is stupid. <laughs> I just you say I mean it would be a failure of of an engagement of the audience I would no, say no I mean like that, and that's and that's an amazing story I mean Ben and Teller are, are, are great role models but this is a thing for you I mean this is like your 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 motto like your axiom has has always been for as long as I've known you that uh, embrace failure that yes. that uh, that failure is uh, the lifeblood of everything that's good in the world. 
you know, and, and <laughs> pretty much, pretty much <laughs> like stop succeeding. You're ruining everything with your successes. Everybody fail, only fail. Yeah. Well, I mean that, that like, you know, you gotta, you gotta run a couple boats into the rocks before you understand how to sail. And, and, you know, as much as we, I guess really, and this is what I've always, it was something that for me was very uh, debilitating and, and I've tried to suppress and I'd be curious your, your point of view on it, but like, the prodigy complex is something that I think is insidious. It is, it is a dangerous Oh, the idea. Dangerous You're thing. talking about the myth, the lie of yes. somebody being good. The, the Mozart lie. Like everyone's yeah. like, oh, Mozart wrote crap when he was five years old because he's just born good. That doesn't exist. What happened was yeah. by the time he was five years old, he had been playing for three years. And so he was as good as you would expect somebody who's been playing three years to be. And also, like, what? There's no YouTube videos of five-year-old Mozart. I mean, that's not a lie. <laughs> Everybody's lying back then. Who cares? You're just like, oh, you're at some French brothel, and you're like, oh, I saw this five-year-old play a piano. Next thing you know, it's fact. Uh, well, anyway, the answer is, like, nowadays, when a trick goes bad, I just say, ah, screw it. Magic sucks anyway, and I storm off, and then everyone laughs. And I'm like, no, just kidding. Here, let me do a real trick for you. And it's like you, you build up enough alternative routines that you could always cover something up. Like, there, there's one trick that I do that, that reliably, one time out of every 70 times, so about maybe, maybe once a year, uh, due to factors beyond my control, due to somebody not following instruction or whatever, I know for a fact one out of 70 times, it will full on, it'll be seven minutes of buildup, and at the end, the two images will not match. And when they do, this is the most amazing thing to me. I will say, I will point at the images that obviously don't match, and I'll say, and that's why I don't believe in ESP. And I'll put my hands out like this, and they'll all start clapping. I'll say, yeah. give them a huge round of applause. They were a lot of fun. Oh, now let's do a real routine. It's like, it's, it's the craziest thing. Nothing matters, you know? Well, and part of it is also understanding expectation versus what you understand to be the goals that you are hitting. Because an audience in any performance, they don't know when like in in a shakespearean performance they don't know when the curtain came up five seconds late you know right like if if you started doing the shakespearean uh the open to hamlet right yeah and the curtain was still down and you were and, and the actor just started doing it and then they pulled the curtain up the audience would think oh wow that's an interesting artistic impression that they right. gave that they began it blank and then you can read into symbolism of why we began it without seeing the audience it, it could be read as artistic whereas the actor would be like why didn't this jerk pull a goddamn curtain sooner than you know he did right and the same thing is, is with magic if you just go boom joke then they think oh that's a funny part that's like where the the end of the magic trick should be and instead he did a joke that's an interesting artistic decision as opposed to well he totally screwed up except when i watch your magic act because I've seen it so many times. If you do it then, I'm like, wow, that trick screwed up. And then I yeah. run up and down the aisles. And along going, that, Screw I was up! Gonna... <laughs> Screw up! I need, you, I need you to stop jumping on stage, grabbing the mic out of my hand and saying, he done goofed y'all! Yeah. Boo this man! Boo! <laughs> All right, here, I'm going to do this. There's always a delay in the comments that we get from the, uh, uh, there, there's like, I don't know, it feels like a 30-second delay. So starting right now, get ready to start asking your questions. We'll do like a lightning round, and we'll just let that start passing over like a river over us. One of the things that people are asking is, um, you know, where do I see Scam School in five years? Man, it's, it's like, uh, I just, I would love for us to just be able to keep doing what we're doing. As long as, as, long as I'm making Scam School episodes, uh, to be honest, what it is at that point is going to be up to you guys. You know, it's like uh, we're going to zig and zag and listen to our audience as, as you guys, uh, you know, tell us what, what you want to see, man. Uh, Life's a river, kid. You got to go where it takes you. All right. Someone is telling me to say his name, which I definitely will not do because he has been spamming the chat the entire, entire time. So take that, jerk whose name I won't say. Uh, Tanme Pancholi wants to know how long I've been a professional magician. Um, I guess uh, I quit my day job in May of 1999, and within two years, I had, uh, I had made it to the Tonight Show. But that was, uh, and then, you know, after the, really the next year, I started actually making money. Um, let's see. World of Illusions says, hope you, uh, you have a great show. Thank you very much. That's, uh, I'm glad to hear that. Uh, a lot of people don't know that, you know, my, my day job is to have 
this uh, stage show that I tour all over the United States with. There's a few clips. If you search Brian Brushwood Nerdtacular, N-E-R-D-T-A-C-U-L-A-R, uh, I think they've chopped up most of my stage show and put it on there. Uh, so that would be fun to see. Uh, let's see. What are your top three slights of hand for us to learn? Man, that's a good question. I don't know. To be honest, um, you know, it, it depends on where you are. I mean, I know, I know my most versatile things. You should learn to do, you know, uh, you should learn some way to bring the card to the top of the deck. You should learn some false shuffles and cuts, and you should learn how to palm cards. With those, you could tour all, all over the United States. Uh, Adam wants to know if my true middle name is Alan. Yes, of course it is. Uh, when did I start doing magic? <laughs> what a ridiculous name to make up. Yes. <laughs> You're like, like, oh, I got to figure out a way to uh, make up a name and really catch people's attention. How about Alan? <laughs> <laughs> we see, when he starts asking me about my social security number, that's when I'll know that there's yeah. something else going on. Where uh, were you in 2007? Uh, yes, exactly. Uh, let's see. Oh, I had something else I was going to say. I already forgot it. Uh, what is your favorite beer? You know, I, uh, everyone says like, oh, Brian loves Guinness. He loves Guinness. Do you know that on the first Scam School episode, I ordered a Guinness just because I didn't know enough about beer to know what a hip brand was? But I know that I knew that everybody respected Guinness, so I so so I just would drink Guinness every show from then on. I mean, I like it. I'm I'm a total beer slut. I like I like all beers. But that's funny because I have been to your house a bunch, like in like company scenarios where like beer is bought for others, and I have never seen you with a Guinness or any version of Guinness in the house. No. Like, it's always just a scam school thing. Yeah, if it's, uh, if it's, I mean, you know, I mean, who cares? It's like, uh, if it's at home, it'll either be like an, an, an IPA or a craft beer or something I just feel like trying or, or just like a Miller Lite or something crappy. They didn't even pay for that. So, yeah, so. listen, number one, Brian, you don't got to be ashamed of the fact that you drink Miller Lite. Really? <laughs> All right. No shame in your game on that. Chris Burke wants to know if there's any chance of coming to England with my stage show. Oh, my God. I have wanted, I have wanted for, uh, for decades, decades to go to, to, go to uh, the U.K. And, and by all accounts, man, there's a lot of fans in the U.K. and a lot of fans in, in Australia as well. Uh, but the answer is, it's like the only way that happens is if somebody books me for a talk, somebody books my stage show at a university or a tour or whatever, or, uh, or somebody brings me to a convention. So really, I mean, it's up to here's, you guys. Here's to... what you do. Okay, you want go. to see Brian? Go on. And you live in England or you live in Australia, there are many big magic festivals that happen uh, in those countries, those are the people that will book Brian. However, there needs to be a outcry for it. And by outcry, five people need to email on the same day. Yeah. So find out who the organizers are for, what, Blackpool in England, the Melbourne Magic Festival in Australia, uh, or, or look up many others, and then just... Get you and four of your friends. They got to make it make it legitimate. Four people that if you go to these conventions or you were interested in going and you would go if Brian was there and you would play, pay full freight and enjoy it, then email the organizer on the same day and say, hey, listen, you really, really should do this. He's great. He's huge on the internet. We really want to see him. We'll go to your convention if he is there. And Magic's a small community, man. Well, it and just, also it doesn't take a whole lot of people to make a ripple. Like, don't underestimate the power of getting a bunch of people to do something at the same time. That is the beginning of what Some is, might say you could make a career on that. Some people, like, I banged that single drum a long-ass time. And the first time, that's how, that's how Scam School, you know, was not destined to hit the top of iTunes until we did a scam. We called it Operation iScam, where we got everybody to subscribe on the exact same day, kicked us up to, like, number three and number seven, where we sat for, like, three weeks. That was instrumental. Everything else was kind of built on that moment, uh, including sales of the books and so on. Uh, let's see. Uh, most difficult scam that I've ever done. Oh, uh, somebody asked if um, if I do private events, and the answer is yes. Uh, just just reach out to me. At, oh, and everyone's always like, "Hey, man, I got an idea for scam school, or I need to contact you. What email should I use?" And I'm so confused. I'm like, "How about the email I give out in the last 300 episodes of Scam School? Maybe that one." It's and then and then somebody writes, and then I write back, and they're like, "Oh, I can't believe I can't believe you actually wrote back." I we really got you. This is Brian Brush. I was like, yes, I'm just a guy. I'm not. To be, to be fair, like, please, please be patient. 
Like, Brian gets a lot of email. Like, I, I am Brian's friend. I will contact, I mean, like, I'm in contact with Brian on a rarely, if not, or not a rarely, on a regular, if not daily basis. Yeah. And I will send Brian emails that three months later will be like, LOL, just saw this. Yeah. So, like. Well, that's, uh, that, is, that is true. It's, uh, uh, just be patient. He reads it eventually. Yes. But it, it takes some time. Here's the secret. If you, if you want to get a response from me, make, make it short and frame it in such a way where I can respond in one line. I will always knock those out immediately where it's just like the, the ones that are like, I just like the ones I fight, I tag for like, look at later. And then I never get around to are the ones that are like, uh, what are, what are your favorite scams and which of the episodes, uh, should I look at, uh, you know, for in general, it's like, I am uh, considering perusing your podcast. If yes. I were to only watch five, how would yes. you, uh, uh, yes. Suggest I watch them and please rank them in order. That's that's those are the ones where I'm just like, Ugh. or it's like, hey, do you have any advice for me? And it's like in those, I just have to respond with like, perform a lot, whatever's wrong with your show. It's nothing a thousand stage shows won't fix, that kind of thing. Uh, oh, uh, you know what? I'm looking at right now. There are a few things that I want to get you guys to do. Uh, if you have not subscribed, uh, do me a favor, click on subscribe. It don't cost you nothing, and it's not going to hurt you. And you can always unsubscribe later, but it means like the world for, for our metrics and our, our numbers. Uh, that is good. What else? Yeah, that's um, youtube.com slash scam school. Oh, you know what? Or Here's a good testtube.com slash scam school. How about this? Is scam school still dependent on sponsors or is it self-sustaining? What I mean is, is scam school creatively free to do what we want or is it limited by sponsor approval? I don't think we've ever had to deal with a sponsor not wanting us to do things. Like the only limitations are if a certain beer is sponsoring an episode, their request will be like, it can't look like we're encouraging a drinking game and it can't, uh, and we would like to not see any competing bands, brands in the background. So we'll just frame a shot to, to match it. But as far as like the content- in the Those show, are the episodes that you shoot in caves. <laughs> yes, yes, exactly. And we bet a soda pop on them. Like, oh, would you like a, a, a generic beverage of some variety? Yeah. Uh, but the, uh, one of the things that keeps coming up is for a while, like the top comments would be an ad skip, like skip the ads, skip the intro. Uh, and it's like, 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 I get it, man. I have a TiVo. And if all you want is to jump straight to the trick, that's great. Then it takes one click to, you know, bump forward on it. But people don't realize when they, when the number one comment is this screw the sponsors thing, like before somebody signs up at scam school, they check out this channel. And when they go through, they, they see, when they see the top comment is screw the sponsors, uh, that makes them think twice about, about going with us to, to bring it. And for those of you like, Oh, you, you get plenty of money from YouTube. Uh, bull. I, you know, yeah. let me just say, let me just say those ads, those pre-rolls, post-rolls do not pay the bills. If, if the promo codes don't get used and if the sponsorships don't get watched, because they got all these metrics, they could tell when you're skipping over stuff. Like they'll be like, oh, watching, watching, dip, dip, watching, watching. Again, sponsors ask for that information as well. And if you are not engaging and you're not getting the sponsors in there, then, you know, then that's, that's a real problem. So if you dig the show, uh, do me a favor, just police those, downvote those comments. Or, you know, my favorite thing was when I pointed this out to some people, what they started doing is posting fake ad skips that led you straight to the ad. They would be all, ah. like, they'd put like, they'd be like 457, you know what it is. And then you'd click on it and it would be the beginning of the ad, which was kind of funny. Let's see, uh, how many thousands of viewers are there right now? I have no idea. Let me get, uh, let me see if Jackie will post in the chat how much that is. Uh, let's see, if my life was We're a book. We're gonna say uh, over 13 <laughs> people, if you, not If thousands. your life was a book, what would it be called? It would be called Capers of a Halfwit. In fact, that'll be my autobiography is Capers of a Halfwit. Uh, let's see. Magicking for dummies. And it's <laughs> magicking with a CK. How to, how to feed your kids despite having no real talent or ability to engage with an audience. Uh, let's see. <laughs> how did Scam School start? Uh, I pitched the idea. I think, we, I think we covered that early on. What about you, Justin? Do you have any questions? Is there anything about this uh, crazy experiments that, that you ever wanted to uh, know? I mean, I would say for, for Scam School, how, what is the biggest thematic difference between the show now and when you first started it? Like, what, are, are there episodes that you would want to do now, however many in you are, that you would say, eh, I don't think that's Scam School initially? Hmm. 
I don't know because like I, the things I notice when I go back and look at old episodes are mainly presentational. It's like I notice how in the first episodes, you know, not knowing what to do, my character is very, very subdued and I'm talking in a conversational way. And it's like, you know, over the years I've seen, you know, I, I've stopped. It was before I was speaking in these these clipped, excited tones and stuff. And there's little things that I would uh, that I would change going back. Um, but that's been the nice thing about Scam School is over the last few years, uh, there's been a constant request to cover more magic stuff. It's obvious that the audience is young magicians. And some people, you know, they do like the puzzles. You know, if, if we do two puzzle episodes in a row, people start howling like, I remember Scam School used to be about card tricks. And then we do two yeah. card tricks in a row. We're like, how come you don't do any puzzles anymore? And can, can we just have an agreement that doing something two weeks in a row does not mean that we're done doing everything that came before two weeks ago. This is a weekly show. Yes. That really all you have to do is like at most wait two weeks uh, and there will be more things. Hey, how about this? I got a question here. Uh, this right. one came in from uh, Sebastian Gonzalez. Okay. Uh, he asks, if Alex Jones asked you to perform a trick for him, what would it be? Pierce! Oh, man. Uh, that would be... Uh, uh, I'd probably... I would probably. Brian, I need you to perform a trick. I would. I would like eat... the trick the federal government is pulling over on the citizenry. I would. I would, I would eat fire and explain. 1776 will rise again unless you do a car trick. I would eat fire and tell him it's an allegory for uh, for dealing with the federal government weighing you down. It's like fire in your mouth, Alex. Talk Finally, a truth teller. Brian Brushwood, everybody. YouTube.com slash Scam School, Pierce. That's where you need to get the real information. We blew it wide open. Oh, my God. Hey, I got a question for the, for the guys in the chat right now. For you guys in the um, uh, posting comments, you know, I really try to uh, hammer on the social. That, like that, that, that's all I really want out of this whole thing is just follow me on some social. You got to do Twitter. You got to do uh, Facebook. You got to do Google+. Plus. You got to do one of those three. Uh, is there any of you guys out there who, who hear that week after week and just still haven't bothered to click? Because because I'm shocked at how many people, like, us, uh, like I'll follow someone on Twitter, and they'll be all like, holy crap, Brian Brashwood is following me. I'm the biggest fan. And I was, I was like, well, but, but you're not following me. So I'm confused as to why yeah. you're the biggest fan. I don't know. We'll see. Uh, so, well, I think everybody should. Go ahead. Uh, follow him on Twitter, at Schwood on Twitter. I got another question here. Rick Pompa asks, yeah. just wondering, what's your take on move monkeys in card magic, people that learn moves for the sake of learning moves? Do you think it's better to learn things as a routine or have a whole bunch of slights in your arsenal just in case a situation arises? So I went through two phases on this. Yeah. I... Started off as a I question monkey. the PC nature of the term move monkey. <laughs> move, move monkey. They call themselves. They call themselves the movement now. Okay, it's gotcha. it's a collective, okay. right? We're the movement. M O V E, large caps. Uh, yeah. No, I uh, I learned a couple of routines early on, but really I became obsessed with all the little moves. Now uh, and then, which some... is which is not uncommon. I mean, would would you say the majority of magicians? Become obsessed with the mechanics as opposed to the routine. Sure, sure, but but that I would be was, that would be my my yes. estimation. No, that's correct. Now, but my thinking at the time was was uh, I want to have all the tools so that I could build my own houses in the future. Um, but the side effect of doing that, there's a downside to it, is that after about three years, I realized I could do all these moves. And I didn't have any routines. I didn't have any material. And I never got around to writing material as a, as a hobbyist. So I would say if, if you want to start off as a hobbyist, if you want to learn the fundamentals of presentation, learn full routines. However, uh, I'll tell you this much, once I quit my day job and I started deciding to, you know, to write my own material, uh, man, I was glad to have all these moves laying around that I knew how to do. And it certainly made it easier as, as you know, to, to do magic jazz just on the fly. But I would say in general, you're probably better off learning routines. But uh, again, try to make them your own. That's here's, for sure. Here's all I'll say. And as, I mean, I, am, I run a magic blog I have for a couple of years and I am not a magician. But from somebody who I guess would be a uh, slightly educated uh, magic consumer, that would be a fun way to, to describe me. Don't think that a more complicated slight makes for better entertainment. 
Because even though it might for you or it might for other magicians, there is a very good chance that it does not make a lick of difference to somebody who doesn't know what the hell's going on. Correct, correct. Uh, Strike says, what are your thoughts on the two-card Monty? And would it be a great episode for Scam School? Uh, you know what's funny is my initial reaction was like, no, man, Scam School is all about stuff you can build at home, and you can't build the, the specifically gimmicked card that you need for two-card Monty. And then I no sooner thought that than I thought, wait, but Scam School is about DIY, making stuff on your own, and I can think of like eight different ways to make a brand new presentation that uses the same idea, maybe with like beer coasters or, or, or you know, business cards or some other crap, uh, in which case, like, that would be totally scam school. So I, I think that's a great suggestion. In fact, if you send me an email, I'll throw it in the uh, idea bin because I'm talking right now, but this idea, just as soon as I'm done, it's going away. Nothing sticks up here is what I'm trying to say. Uh, Brian, do you know what panels you will be doing at Dragon Con this year? That comes from Kyle Jennings. I think the schedule is up at dragoncon.com. And if you're anywhere in the Southwest, you should consider coming out to uh, Atlanta during Labor Day weekend. I'm going to be performing at Dragon Con. I'll be doing my full stage show. Uh, I'll also be joining uh, this guy. Well, I guess I'm not wherever you are. I'm yeah, trying to point I'll talk. At you. Hey, look, it's me. There and we go. Goes- this, guy, this guy, will. Uh, the two of us will do a, uh, a comedy show for another project that we do. For uh, which you can see it on another network. That's correct. Uh, or you know what? You can buy our comedy album, our number one comedy which billboard. Which appears on chart. another album. <laughs> Wait, no, we can talk about the album, right? Can we? No, Is whatever. that allowed? No, that's fine. I'm joking around. Uh, so yeah, no, the comedy album, Night Attack, and Night Attack uh, 2, Enjoy the Garden, available now. Um, and coming soon, Night Attack uh, live, live from, from Utah. Utah. Yeah, in fact, uh, I'm will, supposed to get that tomorrow. Uh, the sound engineer be, but, is supposed to put that um, together. But yeah, no, Dragon Con's going to be uh, a blast. Funny story, so uh, one of my oldest friends uh, is coming out this year from Florida. Him and his girlfriend are going to come up to Atlanta. And within 48 hours of him confirming that he was going to do that, he unironically sent me uh, as like, hey, have you seen this funny video, Guy on a Buffalo? No way. That's hilarious. Yeah. And for those of you guys watching, Scam School fans, do yourself a favor and watch all five episodes of Guy on a Buffalo right now. Uh, ooh, Fragicide wants to know how I got into Sideshow Acts. Uh, the, um, uh, I, I had learned how to do the human blockhead, which we talk about on Scam School, uh, when I was in third grade by accident, just with a Q-tip. And then uh, it wasn't until high school that I found out that it was a standard Sideshow thing. I was like, oh, well, I guess I know how to do that. Uh, flash forward to two years later, I'm doing one of my first private uh, shows with this, you know, all the knuckle bucking, uh, knuckle bucking, knuckle busting. Knuckle bucking, buck, bro. Yeah. <laughs> We're just knuckle bucking, bro. It, it, it's fine. Nothing weird about it. Uh, I was doing the knuckle busting uh, card stuff, and I, you know, everyone really liked it. And then at the end, as an afterthought, I was just like, oh, hey, uh, yeah, they're, they're like, do one more thing. I was like, I don't know, uh, here. And I took a nail, and then dink, 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 dink. And the reaction that got was bigger than the whole rest of the show combined. And I was so confused because I was like, no, but, but the other stuff was hard for me. This, this was easy. I don't – why are you happier with this? And uh, wait, but then, like, because even then you could look that up probably, you know? Oh, sure. And, like, you look up, like, 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 the physics behind that, and that's probably why you found that not to be – as impressive because you knew like listen this is just a human physiology thing and yeah. like you know well, all the- you need to know is you know just a few very simple things about the human body as opposed to this move which i'm like using complex time tested misdirection you know or simple uh, exploitations of the way that we expose patterns well this uh, is oh, oh i mean this is the exciting thing because starting with the human blockhead and then, uh, uh, you know, I did, I, I started doing the bed of nails and I didn't want to do that cheesy crap that a lot of the sideshow performers do where they are like, he's going to stop his blood. That's why there's no blood everywhere. Cause you can't lay on nails without blood. And I'm like, dude, this is, this is the 1990s, bro. We've all seen the physics demo. Uh, and, and, and I toyed with the idea of flat out explaining it from the physics standpoint, but, um, but creating a disconnect. For example, the bed of nails that I had designed has uh, four inch nails that uh, you know, were a full inch apart. And I took uh, the bed of nails out to, um, uh, to have people touch them so they would get a visceral idea. Like everyone up and down the aisles who wanted to could touch it. And then now they had an idea 
of how sharp everything was. They saw how spread out they were. Then they watched me because they had sensed it. There's this disconnect. Even though I'm telling them at the time exactly how this works, yeah. it was amazing to me to realize that knowing how it was working while they were watching it happen in no way diminished their enthusiasm for it. And in fact, uh, could be the exact reason that it could be what enhanced it. And, uh, and you'll notice that's been a theme in my show throughout the, the whole time is there's, there's parts of the show that I'll pull back the curtain so that you know they're 100% real. There's other parts I'll pull back the curtain and flat out tell you it's 100% fake. Uh, and then there's the mushy areas where it's up to you to kind of figure out what parts are what. And that seems to be what people really respond to in, in so the what show. You're telling me that these side show acts, like you can look them up very easily on the internet and they're like easily labeled like how to do this, right? Uh, that's a, allegedly, Justin. And you don't have All to like you... pay for it or anything? Like you don't what? have to pay like $2? You like, do to have to go out? to the library. You have to go to the library. Uh, as a matter of fact, it's actually the greatest, the biggest library since uh, the li library of uh, But like Alexandria. despite the fact that this is all over the place, like... People have not like just stood up and said, "This is simple human physiology." Like, no, and, and, it doesn't matter. The secret of it, right? Be because it's about the price. It's about the. It's about the show, man. Huh? You how don't say. Yeah. Wow. It's, fu it's funny how that worked out. Crazy. Uh, okay, what do you consider the one defining moment in your life that made you realize that magic was your future, or what was your inspiration to learn magic and become a magician? Uh, I did not come to magic as a kid uh like i had i had the siegfried and roy magic kit that you know you, same yeah, passing yeah. interest in it as an eight-year-old uh but just like of rhinestones and uh <laughs> yeah, looked, smoke bombs there's no super. magic in it it was just it was a uh, a place it, it gave you a uh, the address and phone number of bill smith uh and it just said ask him to build a dragon and then exactly. uh, the rest of it was costumes uh, let me see if I can find this. Uh, By the way, and this is just like something for magic people. If you are young and are not hip to watching everything that Siegfried and Roy did yeah. on YouTube, go and watch everything that Siegfried and Roy did on YouTube. They like just, and I get it. Yeah. Gay tiger, yada, yada, yada. Like beyond the jokes there. Yeah. Amazing presentation. I mean, like they are an act them and David Copperfield, everybody, and and then David Blaine and and you know Chris Angel, everybody's been ripping them off forever. And then yeah, yeah. they were different branches of a tree that is amazing. So, uh, but the answer as far as like when did I des decide to become a magician? Ma magic was not my first career choice. I wanted to uh, do do three D modeling and animation, uh, which strangely enough my brother does now. He's over at uh, Sony Online. He worked on Planet Side Two uh, and a bunch of other AAA titles. He was on the Duke Nukem team when they got canned. Uh, he uh, uh, but but. Uh, looking at these paths, I did an assessment of my natural talents. I was like, okay, what is it? I'm creative. Uh, I like to think I could solve problems. I'm technical. I know about computers. Uh, I, I, I say something funny from time to time. Uh, what do I love? I love uh, getting credit for having created something neat. Uh, I, I love being on stage and having people clap. I love, you know, and, and all of a sudden I realized, like, uh, the more of these I said, I was like, well, it sounds to me, like, you know, you would be better off being a magician. I was like, yeah, but I don't want to be a magician. I want to make video games. And it's like, yeah, but your natural set of talents seem to say that you should get on stage. And I was like, well, I'm going to give it one year and get it out of my system because I didn't want to grow old and bitter in a job that yeah. I would learn to hate because I would always wonder what might have been. And Stop it was, barking at me, voice in my head. Exactly, exactly. So originally, I just was going to take one year off, get it out of my system, and come back. And at the end of that year, I made crap money. But I saw how it could be done if I just made some changes, learned how to, how to you know, read a bunch of books on sales, on marketing, on development, on management, and, uh, uh, you know, all of that stuff. And slowly, slowly built up to the point where I was able to make decent money. Um, man, I guess uh, we should go ahead and wrap things up here, I think. It's been a little uh, bit. I think we've done good work, Brian. Yeah, thanks the for joining. The world will be marked before and after. We horsed off on the internet. Justin Robert Young, editor-in-chief of iTrix. Uh, everything that's going on in the world of magic. I really, really want to say specifically what famous magicians we know for a fact read uh, iTrix daily, but I guess we can't. Some, some more angrily than others. Some, uh, some of them happily, some of them less happily, but all of the famous magicians read Many of them I usually. Tricks. There's only one. One, you can imagine everybody else who's gotten mad. David Blaine, nothing but a delight. David Blaine has been a cloud of joy. Uh... 
But yeah, no. I, I, listen, for, for whoever reads the site, again, and it's to me, it's not a surprise that name magicians read the site because magic is literally 15 people long, and we see the numbers on the site, and we know at least 15 people read. So it stands to reason that everybody, including the famous ones, do. So if you want to read about magic, then go ahead on nitrix.com. We got a new. Uh, I don't even know what his title is right now, but he is uh, a, a guy who's making the site way, way, way better oh. by the name of Michael Lauk. <laughs> hey, God, um, real quick. In the chat room, they're, they're, they're angry. They're like, hey, man, you were about to tell us a library of all the sideshow acts. Uh, yeah, bro. The library is YouTube. YouTube is the most delightful library to occur possibly in the history of humanity. I feel like we just gave the crappy children's movie ending. Yeah. Where it's like, like, where do I find the gem that gives me bravery? It's in your heart. <laughs> I was there the whole time. All right. Uh, look, let's go ahead and wrap things uh, up. Uh, so yeah, itricks.com, um, Justin R. Young on Twitter. Uh, and then I'll tell you what, super sleuths, follow the clues if you want to see me and Brian on another network. I bet, I bet you can find us elsewhere. Uh, thanks so much for hanging around, guys. You are freaking awesome. It was a lot of fun. Take care, guys. Yeah. yeah. Thursday. Thursday. Bye-bye.